What if we could increase trust and trustworthiness? And it's both a pleasure and a privilege for me to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Maros Savatka, who specializes in experimental and behavioral economics. He is a senior lecturer here at the University of Canterbury in the Department of Economics and Finance, and he is also director of the New Zealand Experimental Economics Laboratory, which is also based here at the university in the College of Economics. Now, Maros is actually widely known um, for promoting the field of experimental economics throughout New Zealand. And the fact that this university is internationally recognized for research in this area is largely attributable to his energetic efforts and hard work. He co-founded the state-of-the-art New Zealand Experimental Economics Laboratory here at UC in 2009. It was finally kitted out and just up and running, I think a week before the earthquake. <laughs> so got off to a rather shaky start. But it is now the main experimental economic research center within New Zealand. It's one of the leading experimental research centers, research hubs within Australasia, and is rapidly becoming a major player worldwide. It's important because it provides researchers with a facility to trial product, projects in advance. It connects UC research to the private sector, and it also attracts international scholars to this university. Turning now to Maros and his personal research interest, Maros is particularly concerned in how factors such as guilt, pride, reciprocity, and other factors influence people's decisions as economic agents. And he has published widely over the years on these topics. Currently, his main research agenda, which combines theory with laboratory experiment and field work, focuses upon the formation of informal and unwritten agreements, which are capable or might be capable of fostering trust and cooperation. And within this context, I think the key question that he addresses is this. If societies benefit from maintaining stable levels of trust and trustworthiness, then what types of instruments are best suited for achieving this goal? And it's these questions and these issues that Maros is going to explore with us this evening. So without further ado, Maros, I'd like to invite you to come up and take over the microphone. Whilst Maros is just settling in up here, um, could I just say that there will be an opportunity for members of the audience to ask questions at the end of the lecture. So if you have any questions, um, rather than interrupt whilst Marosh is talking, perhaps save them to the end. Thank you very much. Excellent. Well, uh, uh, thank you, Sonia. Thank you. Thank you for um, coming. Thank you for the nice introduction. Uh, so, the, you know, as, as Sonia already mentioned, as you see the title, uh, the topic of, of today's talk is uh, Trust and Trustworthiness. Uh, the title is somewhat grandiose. Um, really, you know, what if we could increase trust and trustworthiness? The answer is, well, we'd be better off. Um, but now the question is, you know, how do we achieve that? Um, what type of mechanisms are useful uh, and, and which type of mechanisms can we uh, sort of can we employ to, to uh, achieve this? So the outline of, uh, of today's talk is, um, well, really my, my objectives, my, my goals are somewhat modest. Uh, I would sort of want to present some part of, uh, of my research, part of my research agenda. Uh, and I will sort of try to explain what trust is, how we understand it as economists, and uh, why is it important. Uh, the other goal of today's study is to show you an alternative way of uh, measuring trust. And um, I'm, you know, being an experimental economist, I'm going to advocate um, uh, the use of experimental methods for addressing these type of questions. And hopefully by the end of, uh, of today's uh, talk, you will sort of uh, be somewhat convinced that it is a uh, useful tool for, for studying trust and for studying these type of, type of questions. And um, uh, then after that, what I would like to do is I would like to show um, 
couple of uh, somewhat, you know, intuitive examples. Um, things that are maybe just when you think about it, it just uh, anecdotal evidence uh, that uh, trust and, and trustworthiness could be increased. Uh, but I would like to sort of present it from a scientific point of view. Um, because really the point, our objective is to understand human decision making. We want to understand how people make decisions, why do they make them, how do they respond to incentives. That's what economics is about. We study human behavior, the decision of, you know, uh, of people, real people, uh, and how they respond to various types of incentives. Be these incentives, I mean, be they um, financial or be they, you know, psychological. And um, I will try to provide some some scientific evidence on these um, underpinning mechanisms. Okay, so trust and trustworthiness. Um, tr I mean, those two things, first of all, they, they go hand in hand, right? They, they go, they have to be sort of uh, studied together, right? Because if we have a high level of trust, but there is hardly any trustworthiness, uh, trust is probably going to disappear, uh, uh, you know, over, over time. Uh, why? Well, because the person who is trusting is just being taken advantage of, right? So uh, even sometimes when I forget about, you know, to mention trustworthiness, keep in mind that, that really what I talk about are these two, two things together. Um, now, trust and trustworthiness are really vital components of social and economic exchange. Right? Without their presence, many welfare increasing transactions or interactions would not take place. Right? By wealth, welfare increasing, we just mean a situation when there are two or more parties and um, because of the presence of trust, they can be made better off, both of them, simultaneously. Yeah? Now, um, there's been a lot of research on this, uh, you know, uh, both theoretical and empirical. And um, political uh, scientists uh, sort of showed and, and, and hypothesized that trust has a positive impact on society's well-being. And the idea behind this was, well, um, what it does is it sort of allows to build up social capital and social networks, right? And some, you know, in, in some um, societies where the rule of law uh, is somewhat weaker, these uh, social networks could be very, very important. Uh, so then, uh, you know, economists, empirical economists, uh, came on board and they provided some really nice empirical evidence showing that uh, there was a strong positive relationship uh, between estimated levels of trust in a society and economic performance. Right? And we have, and, and they looked at sort of uh, cross-cultural studies, looked at various uh, countries, and usually the countries with high levels of trust were actually uh, doing better economically. Now, so now the you know big question: What is trust really? Uh, trust has many dimensions. Um, you can think of trust in relationships, right, within a marriage, uh, within a family, uh, friendship. Uh, then you can have, you can talk about some generalized trust, right, towards a stranger. How likely are you trust a stranger? Um, trust towards institutions, right, government, court and so on and so forth. Uh, in politics and diplomacy, right? They're usually we don't observe uh, formal contracts, but there is some level of trust that has to be, uh, you know, between politicians, between diplomats, diplomats uh, they're trying to solve some issue right? <clears throat> for their countries. Um, Canero, uh, in one of, his, um, one of his writings, notes that in the face of transaction costs, trust is ubiquitous uh, to almost every economic transaction. Really, when you are it's some type of economic transaction, you have to sort of trust that uh, the par party you're dealing with is not going to try to rip you off. Okay? Uh, why? Well, if, even if there are transaction costs, right, you might waste your time, uh, you might uh, waste your uh, you know, searching uh, or dealing with this other person, even if the transaction doesn't happen, right? So there are always some type of costs, right? And economists, uh, you know, we are sort of obsessed uh, with various types of costs and particularly the opportunity cost, right? I mean, we could have been doing something else while we were transacting with, uh, with this untrustworthy uh, party. Um, and, you know, uh, on the other hand, uh, if there are uh, significantly high transaction costs, try, uh, trust can actually uh, decrease them, right, and override these unfavorable uh, conditions, right, and economic incentives, right? Sometimes trust can just resolve things such as hold-up problem. Uh, as a hold-up problem, an example would be, suppose you have a uh, buyer uh, who is tr trying to purchase a product, but then the value of the product would be much higher to the buyer if the 
um, seller made some specific investment, right? Just basically fine-tuned the product. The problem is that the seller has to do it before the transaction takes place. Okay? Now, once he already invests, once he makes this uh, little change, right? Then it's up to the buyer whether to pay for this or not. And since the investment has already been made, there are no incentives for the, for the buyer to actually pay for this, right? Now, seller knowing this, right, he actually anticipates that he's probably not going to be able to recoup his investment, and hence he doesn't invest, right? And we have inefficiency, right? Whereas if he trusted that the seller, uh, if the seller trusted that the buyer is going to uh, be fair, he's going to offer a fair price so that the seller would be able to recoup his investment, right, then we might have a sort of more, uh, we might have a more efficient outcome. Okay, so um, in this talk, I'm going to focus on economic uh, transactions, right, and trust in economic transactions. There are several of these. I mean, <clears throat> some are incomplete contracts, just like the one which I, I just mentioned, um, you know, in various business deals. And employment contracts, right? Virtually all, um, in employment, virtually all contracts are incomplete. In a sense, the um, firm pays a wage, right, or the principal pays a wage, and then expects some level of effort, right, a level of work from the, uh, from the worker. Right? But you can't really contract on the specific, sp specified uh, level of effort. Why? Well, because it's unobservable. I mean, how can we tell that one person is trying more, the other one is, person is trying less? Instead, what the, the employer uh, does, he actually trusts, he places trust in the worker right? and tries to motivate him to, to perform the job. Um, think of uh, trade transactions. Right? Often, I mean, nowadays with the uh, with internet, we often observe people transacting on the internet, right? And these transactions are often one shot. I mean, there's huge anonymity, right? Uh, nevertheless, at the beginning, particularly of uh, things such as you know Trade Me and eBay, right? There were no uh, mechanisms uh, or were sort of very weak that would allow for reputation building. Yet people would transact. Okay. Um, other things, uh, think of a situation between, between an investor who has, an op uh, who has money and an entrepreneur who has an idea, right? Uh, if they get together, right, if the investor invests money and, and the, uh, or, or lends money to the um, uh, entrepreneur who then creates a surplus, then he can actually share the surplus with the, with the investor. However, if it's not contractable, Right? The um, entrepreneur could say, well, you know, the things just didn't work out, and hence uh, you're not getting anything back. Okay? So how do economists model trust? Unfortunately, there is no uniformly accepted theory what trust is and how it originates. Now, we do have several models, right? I mean, because economists are genuinely interested in trust. We do have several models with various assumptions about people's preferences, showing that trust could be a product of a uh, rational behavior, rational decision making, right? So, for example, if I believe that the other party is fair, if I believe that the other party is reciprocal, meaning I'm nice to them, they're going to be nice back, uh, if they are, say, guilt averse, that means that they would, uh, they like to behave according to other people's expectations. They don't like to, um, they don't like to let them down. Okay, um, then, um, or if they are inequality averse, right? All these sort of assumptions uh, might rationalize trust, right? I might be willing to sort of invest. I might be willing to uh, sort of uh, trust the other person uh, if, if I kind of know that these are their genuine preferences, but. Uh, as scientists, we're interested in uh, empirical evidence. Okay? So how to study trust? What do we do? Um, so first of all, we need a working definition of what trust is. So Jim Cox, uh, my well, former advisor, now a good friend and, and a co-author, um, in a very nice paper, basically defines uh, trusting action as follows. A person exhibits, um, undertakes an action that exhibits trust if the chosen action creates a monetary gain that could be shared with another person. Okay? So if my action creates a surplus, and at the same time, it exposes me to the risk of a loss of utility, right? Uh, if the other person defects, uh, or possibly appropriates uh, too much or all of the monetary gain. Okay? Um, so basically from this, what you see, if, uh, if we look at, if we define trust this way, uh, if there is no trust, right, there's not going to be any surplus created, okay? And we're going to have inefficient outcome. 
again, as economists, we are obsessed with efficiency. We want to see how these things, you know, how to improve things. How can we better? How can we be better off? Huh? So um, let's. Uh, what I will try to I will try to contrast um, economic experiments with, say, survey. Okay. Um, so we, what we could do when we want to measure trust, we could just ask people. Are you trusting? In fact, one of the uh, very popular survey, surveys, uh, World Value Survey, asks the following questions. Okay, let me just quote. Generally speaking, would you say that most people can be trusted uh, or that you can't be too careful dealing with people? Right? And the possible answers are most people can be trusted, can be too careful, don't know. Okay? Another question. Do you think that most people would take advantage of you if they got a chance or uh, would they try to be fair? And again, possible answers are, well, most people would take advantage, um, or maybe they would try to be fair, or I just don't know. Okay? Now, these questions and these type of surveys might be useful for certain purposes, but not for what we are interested in. Okay? Uh, there are particular issues. First one, usually we just don't know who participates in these surveys. Okay? Uh, second, do responders really care about their answers? Right? Um, or possibly do they just reply according to what is expected from them, right? And some follow some social norms, right? All these things are important for scientific evidence, right? I mean, we want to understand what is it that people are, are talking about. And perhaps the context in which they understand these questions vary, right? From, from person to person. Right? Somebody might be thinking, oh, you know, something happened to me yesterday at the train station, right? Whereas the other guy is thinking, well, what happens, you know, at, uh, at work uh, in, in an environment that I know? Right? So we really want to control these things and we want to pin them down so that we would understand what is going on. So, you know, as, uh, as you can imagine, economists are quite skeptical about surveys. Right? Do people tell the truth? How do we know? Okay. So um, what we'd rather see is what people actually do. Right? In a sense, what we want to find out is, well, I know you might know the idiom, put your money where your mouth is. Right? We want to really know whether what people are stating, whether they are willing to place some money, whether the decisions, if they are salient, are going to be according to what they say. Okay? So uh, the general idea behind economics experiments is to incentivize behavior. Okay? Make it salient. Make it costly. Um, to, I'm going to digress a little bit because this example, uh, I'm going to give you an example with generosity, which I think is a little bit easier to understand. So suppose I wanted to study generosity. And I wanted to know how generous people are. I could go around and I could ask people, you know, how generous are you on a Likert scale from one to five? Right? Well, five, four, people might understand these things differently. Okay? Or I could just say, well, would you say you're generous in that particular situation? Well, maybe yes, maybe no. Um, if somebody, so maybe you want to get some measure on this. So, so let's suppose more concrete scenario. Suppose a scenario that uh, we ask the, the person, suppose you had a million dollars. How much would you donate to a charity? All right, that's, a, that's related to generosity. And the, the amount donated to charity obviously would be some type of measure right, that we could use. So if somebody came to me and they asked me, well, if you had a million dollars, how much would you donate to charity? My answer would be a million dollars. Why? Because I don't have it. Right? I just want to be like the nice guy. Right? I'm being evaluated. I mean, these people are looking at me. And they're thinking, you know, well, is he generous? Is he not? And if it doesn't cost me, hey, I, I want to be the nice guy. I want to be the generous one. Okay? So I would donate everything because it doesn't cost me anything. Okay, so how can we solve this? So we want to make the decision salient. Okay? In the lab, well, if you come to a lab, we would actually give you some money and we would ask you, how can you, you know, how much money are you going to give to a charity? How much money out of X you're going to uh, give to an anonymous, to anonymous uh, student, an anonymous counterpart, right, who is also here with you in the lab? So now the question is about X. How big should this amount of money be? Suppose, you know, I ask you, well, here is 10 cents. How much money would you donate to charity? Well, guess what? 10 cents, because it's not really costly to me. Okay? So I really want to make sure that the amount that I'm talking about is actually salient, that it's meaningful. Okay? So when we, for example, bring students in, we usually would, we would give them about $20. Right? $20, that's you know, uh, about what, one and a half times roughly uh, the minimum wage. Right? So these are meaningful um, amounts of money to our students. Okay? And then we'll let them make a decision. Right? And then you can keep the money, you can keep the $20, in which case you can go to shillings and buy three beers. 
right? Or you can just share it, but then you're, you know, the, these, uh, that decision is going to have monetary consequences, right? You're only going to be able to buy one beer or no beer. Huh? So um, in, in the lab, we actually make our decision salient, and we make sure that these uh, stakes that we're dealing with are actually meaningful to our participants, right? And everything is going to depend on who our participants are. Okay, so this is the lab. This is, uh, you know, this is our New Zealand lab, which we have uh, well rebuilt after the first earthquake in, in the Kirkwood village. And, you know, this is what it looks like. These are basically cubicles uh, where with computers. Uh, and then we can run, you know, computerized experiments where students uh, anonymously interact with one another, right, via computer terminals. Now, what is important is uh, the anonymity. Why? <clears throat> Well, suppose we're still studying uh, generosity. Uh, suppose uh, I want to find out whether somebody's generous, but now these two people know who they are paired with, right? The question is, how much money out of $20 would you give to another person? And you know who the other person is. Okay? Well, suppose it's a guy, and he's paired with a really nice girl that he likes. Okay? He might be extremely generous. Right? We probably, as researchers, wouldn't learn that much about his preferences. What we would learn about is that he likes the girl. Okay? We're not interested in that. Uh, uh, or the other person that he's paired with could be scary, right? Big, muscly guy playing rugby. Well, maybe I'm just scared that the other guy, if I don't share the money with him, he's going to walk out with zero. Maybe he's just going to be mad, so I better share the money with him. Right? As a researcher, am I, am I really measuring true preferences? No, not really. Right? I'm measuring that the, other, you know, that the decision maker is afraid of somebody. So what I want to do, I want to have this uh, interaction anonymous, right? So that I can uh, get rid of all these possible confounds. Okay? Hence the privacy cubicles. Okay, so what is an economics experiment, right? As I already mentioned, we recruit volunteers and randomly allocate them to roles. And then we give them instructions about how to make decisions and about how to make money in the experiment. Okay? Um, and then after that, the interaction follows, right? If it's a market interaction, it could be repeated, or it could be uh, an interaction in some game in some strategic situation, right? We avoid the deception. That's a big no-no in experimental economics. And at the end of the experiment, after the participants made their decisions, we pay them according to their decisions, right? We calculate their payoffs according to what we told them in the instructions. So what are the big advantages of economics experiments? apart from the fact that our participants are financially motivated, and hence, uh, what we like to think, they take um, you know, uh, our questions seriously, right, and decisions seriously. Well, we can control the institution, the environment in which the decisions are uh, taking place, and we exactly know the process that generates the data, right? Where does it come from? Uh, we, are, we can... Um, when you, most experiments are used for theory testing, right? So we are able to reproduce the structure of theoretical models. And we can create a stylized environment where we can observe interaction of two variables, okay? that we are uh, two variables of interest. If somebody doesn't uh, believe the, uh, the evidence, they can always go and replicate it. Right? I can go back and just replicate the experiment at different places, right? Very useful for, for scientific purposes. And probably the biggest um, advantage of experiments is that we can um, uh, introduce truly exogenous ceteris paribus changes, right? We keep everything else in the experiment constant and change just one thing. And then if we observe change in behavior, we know that it is because of this one change from treatment to treatment. Okay? And we can also do other things. We can actually do magic. We can observe unobservables. Right? We can observe the level of effort. Uh, Simon Gechter, uh, who gave a distinguished, uh, Enzil distinguished uh, lecture, was about a month, month and a half ago, uh, talked about this, right? We said, well, what we do is we are able to observe level of effort of, of, of our participants. We can do such things uh, as observe the level of fraud, right? Which in, say, some insurance schemes. Uh, or the level of trust. Trust itself is unobservable, but we're going to come up with a measure, as I will, as I will show, uh, sh soon show. And so, bottom line is that in the field, uh, many details affect behavior in various uncontrolled, in, un in an uncontrolled manner, right? However, in the lab, we can control them and we can also systematically study them. Okay, 
So let me introduce the workhorse uh, for, for studying trust. Something called investment game. It was introduced by uh, Berg, Dickhardt, and McCabe in uh, 1995. And it's a really a one-shot game that studies trust and trustworthiness. So here's the setup. You have two anonymously uh, paired players. Player A uh, can be, you know, call him an investor. Uh, and player B could be, you know, represent an entrepreneur. Both are endowed with 10 New Zealand dollars. Okay? Again, this is uh, the, um, the stakes over here are the, you know, uh, what we would how we would probably like uh, run this game uh, if we r ran it over here in the lab, right? If we, with students, if we had different subject pool, right, uh, we would, might want to vary these stakes, right? Because uh, for working people, $10 is not enough. Could be, you know, some, sometimes it has to be more if, it, if we wanted to measure the, or, or look at decision behavior of, say, CEOs, we would probably have to take, pay them way more to basically cover their opportunity cost, right? Cover uh, the, their cost of time for coming to the lab and so that they would take these decisions seriously, okay? Okay, so here's, here's how, the, how the game works. It's a two-stage game. In stage one, um, player A can send some amount S to player B, right? So he has his, his $10, and he can decide how much out of these $10 to send to player B. Uh, and he can send zero, he can send, you know, positive amount, he can send everything, right, all $10. Uh, why would he want to do that? Well, <clears throat> one reason is that the amount sent is tripled by the experimenter in the game, right? So whatever he sends is going to get tripled. If he sends $1, player B receives three, right? If he sends $2, player B receives six. If he sends all 10, player B receives 30, okay? And so this really represents surplus created um, by the transaction, okay? Then in stage two, player B observes this tripled amount and decides how much to return back to player A, okay? from, this, from this tripled amount. Two important things, right? The, uh, the game is played anonymously. There is no communication. And then at the end of the game, all players are uh, paid privately uh, in cash based on their decisions. Right. So here is a sort of um, graphical representation of the game. Right? If, uh, I kind of prefer this uh, than, than just looking at words. Right? So player A decides, he has $10, decides how, how much of these $10 to send to player B. Uh, player B receives this tripled amount right? and then decides how much to return. So how much do they get at the end, right? So the first mover receives $10, which he had at the beginning, minus the amount he sent, plus how much was returned to him, okay? Player B has his original 10, the endowment, plus he receives three times S, and minus how much he sends back, okay? So how would you behave, okay? If you were player A, just think about it for a second, just pause. How would you behave? Suppose you're in this experiment, suppose it's, you know, uh, instead of $10, put an economically meaningful amount there for you. Okay. How much money would you send? Right. This is your money right, that can end up in your pocket. If you send it, it creates surplus, but then really it's up to the other person how to split this. Right. All you know is that somebody ha who is sitting here with you in the lab is going to make this decision. You don't know whom. Right. There's no way the other person is going to thank you Right? There is no way you can enforce the, other, enforce the transaction. There is no way you can talk to the other person afterwards and get your money back. Would you trust them? How much would you send? Would somebody send everything? Very few. Okay, one, two, about three hands. Would somebody send zero? All right, one, yeah, economists. Yeah, yeah, good, economists, good. Um, I don't really know myself personally because I've just you know I, I, I've ran this experiment uh, this experiment many times and uh, I'm, I guess I'm just so influenced by by students and and what they what they make so it's really hard for me to think uh, that way um, you know the question is why would you send well probably you know very few people uh, decided to send everything that is because they wouldn't you know they were just not hundred percent sure that they would get uh, their money back okay some were thinking about zero but they they were almost sure that they wouldn't get anything back. Right? And most of you, I presume, are somewhere here in the middle. Say, oh, I would send, send something, but I don't really want to lose absolutely everything, right? my whole endowment. Right? Okay, now put yourself in the position of the player B. Suppose now that the first mover sent everything. Okay? Sent everything, you have now received tripled them up. Okay? You have $30. Uh, 
how much would you return? All right? And again, remember, you don't have to tell me, right? Because once you tell me, you're going to be judged. Okay? Uh, and that's the key, right? It's, it is really important that it is anonymous, right? Because you're going to be judged. Even by, you might even be judged by the experimenter, right? So it's possible. I mean, we sometimes run these experiments so that nobody knows. We just know how to calculate the payoffs. We put them in envelopes, uh, put these envelopes in, um, uh, in mailboxes. Students' uh, uh, decisions are just identified by a key. They receive a key to the, to the mailbox, take the money out, and we sort of never, uh, you know, uh, never interact face to face. Right? That way they don't have to look, us, look me in the eye uh, and say, well, because there's only one way how a player B is getting $40. Right? The first mover invested, the player B kept it all. Okay? So um, what happens, you know, some people keep everything. Some people share the surplus. Sometimes, very rarely, people return everything. Most of the time, you know, we, we observe uh, sharing of the surplus. Right? Why? Well, because people, you know, Many of us actually are sort of trustworthy, right? I mean, many of us, when somebody is nice to us, we like to reciprocate, right? There could be various other motivations, right? Some, I mean, we are often generous. It could be that we are inequality averse. All these are possible motivations of why people might return money. All right. Um, so what does theory tell us? Well, the theory tells us is, well, socially optimal behavior is that player A should just send $10, right? And that way he creates 30 for the pair. And then player B returns at least 10 to player A, and together they have 40, right? That's the best, best case scenario. The sort of neoclassical prediction for homo economicus, basically selfish folks, is that, um, well, you just use backwards induction, right? Player B is selfish. Whatever money he receives, he's not going to send back. If he doesn't send it back, then player B, uh, player A knows this, and thus he will send zero, right? Because he just knows that he's going to lose money if he sends. And this is an inefficient outcome, right? Because together they uh, end up with 20, right? So notice that a trust can actually make both of them better off, okay? Trust and trustworthiness. Yeah? Okay, so let's take a look at subject behavior. This is an experiment that I ran here in Enzil with uh, my good friend and co-author Rado Vadovic. Uh, it was an experiment that ran about, uh, that took about 15 minutes, and subjects on average earned about $18, right? So roughly around the uh, stakes that I, that I mentioned earlier. So this is our data, okay? Uh, the blue columns represent amount sent by the first movers. The red ones are amount returned, and they're always paired, right? So notice these guys over here, there's well like eight of them. Player A sent zero, and obviously players B couldn't return anything, okay? There are some people here in the middle Right? So, for example, this guy sent $2, player B received 6 and he sent $2 back. Okay? Then there are some people right over here, who's, uh, player A's, who sent, they sent all 10. Right? Notice how much player B's returned. <laughs> Zero. Right? They just kept it all. Sometimes I feel, I feel bad for these students. Right? I mean, they come to the experiment, we promise them that they're going to, on average, going to make money. Right? And then this happens. And I, I just, you know, wait, and I'm like, that. I don't know. I mean, sorry. <laughs> I guess that's what happens. We always pay them $5 show-up fee for coming to the lab so that they would come back again. Uh, obviously, the ones who earned 40, right, they're back, I mean, immediately. It's like, when is the next experiment that I can participate in? <laughs> and then, you know, you have these guys over here, right? Uh, there were, these guys trusted. They sent all 10. And these guys were very generous, right? I mean, well, they just shared the surplus. And notice how we can share the surplus. These guys, uh, these three, people over here, uh, they split it 50-50, uh, right? Meaning, I have $20, you have $20. Or, you can just look at it this way. Well, okay, you sent $10, that created 30, so I'm going to split the 30, okay? Now, what's mine is mine, I'm giving my 10, but I'm going to split the, the 20. So this was, for example, this subject uh, over here, right? Who returned 15. All right, so on average, players, uh, player A's sent $5.50, right? Showing that there is some trust. Uh, player B returns on average $4.90. Hmm. Outcome better than the neoclassical theory predicts, but the return, amount returned is smaller than the amount sent, right? So here we have the issue of trust versus trustworthiness. Players B are, you know, uh, better off, but players A, not really on average. Okay? And plus there's still enough room for, for improvement, right? I mean, we can send all the way to 10, right? 
So here's the question, which actually Sonia also mentioned, right? So if societies benefit from maintaining stable and, and high levels of trust, what can we do, right? Are there any mechanisms that will allow us to increase trust? Okay? And can we show some evidence for this in the lab? Okay, so this is a paper which we called Building Trust One Gift at a Time. We looked at the negotiations literature, uh, and um, negotiation literature, there's this very common theme that says uh, when parties negotiate, one way of, to win the trust of the other party is to make concessions and to clearly explain how much these concessions cost. Right? And so you sort of build, uh, you, you kind of try to establish some sort of reputation that you're a nice guy, right? because otherwise you, you just meet and you know, there's no trust at all. Um, so, you know, what does it mean? We interpret this as, you know, maybe some gifts, right? I mean, there are reasons when, before business, uh, business meetings, sometimes people just bring a bottle of wine. Um, communication, right? People talk before they transact, before, before they strike deals, right? So how to test this? Well, here's what we did. We introduced um, modifications to the investment game. Right? So we're going to take this baseline, the investment game which you just saw, and now we're going to study two things. The effect of messages, effect of communication, where in the pre-game phase, player B has the option to send a free-form written message to player A. Right? So virtually what we did, we gave a sheet of paper to player B and he could write, he or she could write anything uh, they wished on, on this piece of paper. Right? Then we collected these and gave them to their counterpart, players A. Right? Now, we knew what the matching was, they didn't. Okay? Um, and message may signal commitment to trustworthiness. I mean, if you were asked to do this, what would you say? Right? Most people say, well, listen, uh, trust me. I'm, uh, um, it might sound cheap, right? But what I want to do is both of us could be better off. And um, if you send the money, I'm going to be fair. I'm going to share the surplus. And this is sort of majority uh, of, of messages. All right. Um, the other treatment is gift. Okay. So now this is not any more kind of cheap talk, right? Because now I am trying to show that I am nice by giving you a gift. In a pregame phase, I, I have an option to give you my ten dollars endowment as a gift. Okay. Here you go. Before we start transacting, I can just give you something. All right. I'll, I'll give you everything that I have actually. So now notice this is sort of costly communication. Right? It costs me a lot of money. Okay? Is it going to work? Well, we'll see. And then finally, we allowed for interaction. Right? Because sometimes, often a bottle of wine comes with a handshake. Right? And people talk. Right? So if I give you a gift, I want to have the ability to explain to you why, I, why I'm doing this. And so in the pregame phase, over here, player B had the option to send a message and or to transfer his $10, uh, $10 endowment. Okay? So he can take advantage of both worlds. Okay. I like to ask questions. I, I do this to my students all the time, too. So how would you uh, rank these four treatments in terms of efficiency, in terms of trust? Did any of these, right? So we have, we have a baseline. Which was which we just saw that on, on average uh, players uh, player A would send about 550. What did gift do? Right. As personally, I will tell you as an economist, I expected that something that is costly is going to work really really well. Right. Now then, comparing to the baseline, how would just a message? Right. Cheap talk. Right. How would that work? Right. Because again, you're an economist. Right? I mean, think of the think of the. Um, think of the uh, incentives. Right. You're anonymously paired with another person. Okay, uh, and this person will never find out, right, whether what you write is true. What's the best thing to write? Hey, you know, I'm a nice guy. I'm going to share this if you invest, but then I just keep everything. Okay, nobody's going to find out. There's no punishment. This is it's legal, right? I mean, it's it's allowed. Would that work better? What do you think? No. Yeah, you guys are economists. Yeah, that's what I thought, right? I, I, I was almost sure that the gift was going to work for, uh, work the best. Uh, interaction, possibly. Okay, that was my. So I thought baseline, communication, maybe a little bit, uh, gift, and then somewhere around that also gift with communication. Okay, I was wrong. Messages alone work work the best. I mean, they're so 
efficient, right? In fact, the, uh, the amount sent was like 9.3 following a message. Okay? Unbelievable. I mean, the, the communication itself uh, was, uh, I mean, just, that's miracles, really. Um, gift alone, as it turns out, does the worst in terms of, cre uh, you know, creating trust. It still increases it, but it doesn't that much. Right? But, you know, uh, the participants, there's, there's, there's something fishy about it, right? There's something fishy because maybe it's kind of like preparing for defection. You're trying to lure me in, right? Uh, whereas they didn't believe, uh, they, they, they didn't think this about messages. They actually believed the messages. And... Um, as you can think, uh, and as you can imagine, we, we did a content analysis of these messages, right? We had, um, uh, we employed students uh, who coded the messages, and then we analyzed it into various categories, and then we analyzed what type of messages actually were most, most effective. And as it turned out, a promise to make both people better off was the one that really worked. Okay. So, you know, interesting evidence that uh, costly incentives uh, might not improve trust uh, to the same degree as, you know, free thing, just as, as cheap talk. Interesting result. This is just the, the overall behavior, right? So this is the one that I already showed you, the baseline, okay? Uh, look at the, the blue lines, right? That, that tells you about the level of investment, right? So there's way more level of invest, way more investment in gift and also in interaction. There's lots of investment in communication, right? But also notice the sea of red, over here, right? People were really trustworthy, right? They kept their, their promises. Right? I promised to uh, share the surplus, and I did, right? It doesn't mean that I don't prefer more money to less. I just keep my word. Okay, so this uh, led us to a new, uh, new study, uh, which is really fresh out of the oven. We call it ABC on Deals. Uh, it's with uh, Martin Dufenberg, University of Arizona, and again, Rado. Um, we look at two things. We look at binding, con uh, binding uh, uh, contracts, which exist, right? Uh, but which are sometimes not feasible. Think in developing countries, right? Where the rule of law is not so strong. Uh, the uh, courts are corrupt, okay? Um, sometimes they're illegal, for example, with cartels. Okay? Uh, sometimes prohibitively costly, right? When you ha have to think about every single contingency. Right? I mean, sometimes it's just impossible to, to write a contract and, and sort of predict all the circumstances, all the contingencies that could, that could happen. Um, however, we do have a lots of theory on contracts. On the other hand, there are informal agreements. Right? People often strike these informal agreements. I mean, we have a lot of uh, anecdotal evidence. Right? We strike agreements all the time. Uh, they're easy. They're flexible. Uh, they build social capital. Interestingly, there's no theory on them. I said, ah, you know, something we can do, something that we're interested in. And so here are, uh, here are our ideas. What we want to do is we want to uh, build a behavioral model uh, of deal making, which is going to sort of include uh, binding contracts and, and informal agreements as special cases. Okay? And, uh, and these two things should be related somehow. And the underlying idea is we want to know is what shapes agreements and how, you know, how do they look like? Uh, where do they come from? Okay. So, um, again, as you know, uh, when you sort of put my theory, theorist uh, hat on, uh, you have to start somewhere. You have to start with some assumptions about how people behave that will allow you to sort of develop the, the, the theory and, and predict some or come up with some predictions of behavior. The most outrage, uh, outrageous assumption that we made is that people are mostly honest. Okay? We've already presented this paper quite a few times. And, and, you know, when it's among experimental behavioral economists, they say, oh, okay, yeah, yeah. When it's hardcore economists, the sort of neoclassical guys that I talked about, they're just like, ah, what are you talking about? And then we say, look around you. Right? Look around you. Would you say that if you, if you make a promise, what was the last time you made a promise? What was the last time you agreed on something? Did you renege? All right? Now, then the problem becomes, well, sometimes they say yes, sometimes they say no. I usually say, well, the reason why I do that is because of my reputation, right? Because I know that I'm going to be repeatedly dealing with, with these people. And so it is important for me to not to renege, right? To behave as, uh, as agreed. So this is a problem, right? Because we want to, again, get some evidence on this. 
And so how do you get this evidence? I mean, hardly ever we observe these one-shot interactions. Well, maybe it's like I mentioned on the internet or maybe in large cities, but then again, we want to collect the data, right? So, you know, then we took off, we took off our um, theorist heads, right? And we put our experimentalist heads and we go to the lab to test these things. Um, the other two ideas that uh, we want to test is that people suffer because of overcoming temptation to renege, right? So even though if we agree on something, once there is a big pile of money on the table, it's still tempting. I'm a, I'm a really honest guy, but maybe everyone has its pri his, his or her price, right? If the pile of money on the table is too big, maybe I would renege? I don't know. We wanted to take a look at it, right? But for sure I know that I'm being tempted. Okay? We wanted to see how does this temptation affect the agreements okay? and, the, and, and uh, their shape. And then finally, most of previous theory focuses on, the bargaining theory focuses on uh, looking at preferences, right? people's preferences, and represented by their some utility functions. Okay? And then it just assumes that we're going to work with these in order to share the surplus somehow in bargaining. The problem is preferences or utilities are unobservable. Right? I mean, how do we, how do we know what we, what is observable are dollars, dollar payoffs. Right? So our assumption is that we're going to, uh, we're actually going to assume that since these things are unobservable, people are just going to split the surplus down the middle. Okay? And there is, you know, already some existing evidence on that, that people actually often do that. Okay? All right. So here's, um, here's the game. It's, it's, it's a simplified uh, variation of this investment game. Uh, I call it a lost wallet game. Um, and so what you have is you have a player A who is deciding whether to stay out and just get his outside option, which and D was our parameter, so we actually varied this, or whether to go in, right? in which case he foregoes the outside option, but then such an investment creates $30 for the pair, which is to be split by player B. Here's how we, um, here's how we looked at this. Um, in our experiment, we allowed for the possibility of forming an agreement. Um, the agreements varied between binding contracts and uh, informal agreements. If the agreement um, was a binding contract, right, then uh, it was immediately implemented. Okay, so here's how such bar bargaining um, looked like. The players uh, anonymously uh, negotiated about how to play this game. Okay? So one of them, one of the pair, was randomly selected to um, come up with a proposal. Right? A proposal would go something like this. I propose that um, I go in, right? I am player A, and you split, you, you know, you give me $20, okay? and you keep 10. Player B uh, would see this proposal, and he could say, well, he could either agree and accept this, right? in which case they had an agreement, or he could say, well, no, I don't like that. So he could reject the proposal and make a counter proposal. Okay, saying, no, 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 I propose that I go in and uh, we split uh, the surplus down the middle. I get 15, you get 15. Right? And then player A again would see this uh, offer, and then he could again accept, reject, and make a counter proposal. Or actually, he could also um, you know, toss his toys and say, you know, I'm, I don't want to negotiate anymore. Okay? So if um, in a treatment where, uh, in a binding contracts treatment, Right? Uh, this agreement was immediately implemented. Right? This is what happened in the game. If the, ga if the uh, agreement was informal, the players still had to play the game. Right? They just got a message. You agreed to this. Right? Player A does this, player B does this. If negotiations failed, players still had to play the game right? following failed negotiations. Okay, so let me just uh, briefly tell you um, about our results. First one, do agreements form? Right? Interestingly, if given the opportunity, 98% of subjects made an agreement. Okay? They, probably, they must have felt that it was in their best interest to do so. Okay? Now, the outrageous assumption. Are people honest? Do they honor agreements? And now we're looking at informal agreements, right? Uh, because the, the bindings one, but binding ones were all, uh, immediately uh, implemented. Right, so do they honor informal agreements? As it turns out, 98% of player A's 
and 69% of player Bs were honest. That means they exactly did what they uh, agreed on. Okay. About one third of subjects do, did, uh, who did one third of subjects uh, who did not honor agreements. Um, however, the interesting thing is that when they did not honor the agreement, there was only about 10% of subjects who were completely selfish. Right? And now I'm talking about players B. Right? Uh, I'm talking about players B who, you know, so say the agreement was I get 15, you get 15. Most of them, when they reneged, they didn't renege completely, saying it's like I'm just keeping all 30. Only 10% of people did that. Right? Most, if they renege, they say, well, I kind of don't like this split that we agree on, and I just want to have the upper hand, so I'm going to take 16, you get 14. Okay? But they wouldn't screw the other person completely. Um, which was quite interesting. Right? Which was quite interesting. It means, you know, um, according to our uh, definition, they were not honest, but they were not completely selfish. Meaning that they just probably didn't agree to the terms of the deal. Now, if agreements are binding, do people split the surplus down the middle? As it turns out, yes. Right? The 86% of our subjects split the, the surplus equally. Outside options do not matter. Right? Uh, and um, what is interesting, if they don't split the, uh, the surplus equally, they tend to negotiate for a long, long, long time. Right? Uh, because the 50-50 split over here is legitimate. Right, whereas the other one, well, probably not so much. Okay? And so they become hard bargains. Player A's are sensitive to their temptations of selfish fringe, right? So I did say that um, we assume that most people are honest. I didn't say that everyone is honest. Okay? And uh, whether player A's invest depends on their expectations of how many people are dishonest. And obviously, the higher their expectations, the more, uh, you know, uh, if they think that there are, there's a lot of uh, dishonest people, then it, it's not really rational for them to enter the agreement unless they get compensated, unless the agreement actually gives them more right, of, the, of the pie. Similarly, players B are sensitive to temptation. Okay? If we vary temptation, right, then players B need to be compensated for, uh, for this uh, when the agreements are made. Overall, we have a really nice result here, right? That we're very excited about, right? Agreements increase efficiency, uh, and they make both players better off. Right? Uh, so it's yet another mechanism for which we have provided scientific evidence that it actually increase, increases trust and trustworthiness. Now um, we are uh, we're very excited about this, and uh, we want to take this outside of the lab into the field. Uh, we want to take a look at. Actually, we already started looking at uh, honesty of taxi cabs in Mexico City, and we have some really interesting, almost I would even say shocking data of how honest people are. Um, as it turns out, um, maybe I'll just, I'll just give you a one-minute version of that. Um, Rado Varovich, one of my colleagues, he lived in Mexico City where he was, uh, he was a professor of economics at ITAM. And... Um, I visited him a few times, and every time, our, uh, every time we took a cab, our impression was that the cab driver was trying to rip us off somehow. Right? Uh, now, why is this? Well, Mexico City is a huge metropolis of about 25 million people. There are about 100,000 taxi cabs that are not, uh, are, these are basically individual cab drivers that have their own car and they just have a license. So interaction is basically you know, one shot, anonymous. Right? You, you get into a cab, you're never ever going to see this person again. Okay, the chances, the probability is really, really small. Right? And so what they were trying to do, you know, they were trying to get some money out of us. So we figured, well, it could be because we are foreigners. So we actually hired, uh, we actually hired uh, confederates, uh, hired research assistants who helped us, uh, who were locals and who helped us run this experiment. And uh, what we asked them to do is to deliver a CD from point A to point B. Uh, the, these two points were about 30 minutes uh, drive apart. Right? And... Um, at the beginning, right, uh, we asked, uh, so con Confederate at, at point A would ask the cab driver to deliver the CD, and he would pay him up front. He said, how much is it? And he said, here's the money. There's going to be another guy, a friend of mine, who needs the CD, CD and he's going to be waiting on that corner. Okay? Uh, our expectations, we thought it was, was going to be like zero people are going to deliver. 
We talked, you know, but then again, we're foreigners, right? We don't know. So we asked the locals, right? What did the locals think? And people are like, nobody's going to come. I mean, it's just, you know, you give them money, they're going to disappear. We were shocked. About 86 people, percent of, of cab drivers actually showed up and brought the CD. Right? People are quite honest. Right. We made sure, and you know, by the way, in the design, we really made sure that there's, there's nothing to do with the reputation, right? That the guy wouldn't look, kind of try to look at the stereo, the license plate, try to memorize or anything. Right. We were just, I mean, we were just shocked. Uh, so, you know, the, there is overwhelming evidence that people are honest. Right. Now, the question is, when are they honest? What makes them more honest? And so on and so forth. Um, all right. So, these are two mechanisms, right, that we studied. There are many others uh, that look at, you know, how to increase trust and trustworthiness, right? I mean, there's a vast literature on this. Uh, there are things studying communication, per se. Martin uh, Dufenberg, right, with Gary Charnas, has a beautiful paper on promises and why promises work, where they actually show uh, the effect of, uh, of the mechanism of, on individual behavior. Things such as reputation, right, uh, and competition might matter. Uh, Escrow accounts, right, where you have to deposit, um, you have to deposit some amount of money just in case you default. Satisfaction guaranteed, right? We know uh, from uh, that we know from uh, sales, right? I mean, you can return the product if you're not happy, right? These these things tend, uh, and these mechanisms tend to uh, increase uh, trust and, and trustworthiness. But then there are other things, right? There are things such as distrust. What if I signal distrust? What if I try to, as a, as a principal, as an employer, what if I try to control my worker, right? What if I lock the door all the time, right? What if I uh, monitor him all the time? These things might matter, right? And when, when they matter and when they don't, again, Rado has a beautiful paper uh, st studying this. But there are many, many others. Um, so, you know, why do we do this? Uh, like I said, trust at the beginning, trust is a phenomenon present in many economic and social activities. All right? It's capable of increasing efficiency. And we show that you know, if we increase efficiency, I mean, people can be better off. Right? Both parties could, could be better off. The question is how to do it. Right? What is the best mechanism? And we're, we're dealing with, hu uh, with humans, right? with, with real people. And people are different. They have different preferences. So the question is, which mechanism works be better than the other? Do they work at all? Yeah. Um, you know, we don't have universal answers, uh, and we sort of keep chipping away at the task. Right? Uh, in order to sort of understand more about human nature, it is really crucial to understand also the psychological underpinnings of behavior, and also how these under psychological underpinnings um, interact with economic incentives. Okay? And hopefully, I convinced you that the lab is a very useful uh, tool uh, to study the details of psychological uh, reactions. Right. Um, for the future, I mean, we keep exploring uh, various other mechanisms and, and institutions. We also want to focus on different strategic and contextual environments, right? Go outside of the lab, figure out whether the things that we observe in the lab in these stylized conditions, whether we observe them uh, in sort of more natural, realistic scenarios. And Although I was you know, strongly advocating uh, lab experiments, we also do want to employ complementary scientific methods. Right? Uh, surveys are not always bad. Uh, we want to use them. Uh, we want to observe empirical data. Uh, we want to run field experiments as well. So, thank you. <clears throat>